Tonight I am doubly honored to introduce to you a man of God that lives a life, not just words. A man of God that has paved a road so well for me and my generation and given me a safe passage to revival. Bishop Wilson, we're so thankful you're here tonight. And we are honored that you're going to preach. Come tonight, follow the Holy Ghost. We love you. Let's give him a hand as he comes. Oh, Lord, hallelujah. Let's worship Jesus. He is so worthy. Come on, lift your hands and your voice and your heart and your mouth. Come on, put some energy in it. I love you tonight, Jesus. I praise you tonight, Jesus. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Brother Buxton. What an honor to be at this meeting, passing the torch 2012, and uh, to be a part of this august body, the Congregation of the Righteous. You know, when David was singing about the greatness of Jerusalem, the greatness of God's kingdom. At that time, Jerusalem was only about eight acres. I mean, that's not... I mean, I own two-thirds of Jerusalem, if that's what you're going by. It's only about eight acres. But that's a mistake you make when you judge by human categorization about what is truly great and what is truly powerful. And that's the way I mean it when I say I am glad to be in this august body, the church of the righteous God. It is the greatest group in the world. Are you glad to be a part of the church tonight? Oh, come on, let's praise him again. Thank you, Lord, for this great victory. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And thank you, brother and sister elder, for the privilege to be here, my Lord. The elders are... Uh, the elder family is older than dirt. I mean, they're just... They just go way back. And, um, and then... Uh, Uh, I think the first time I met him, Brother Elder here was probably somewhere between 16 and 19, playing the trumpet, wearing a white suit in a sawdust tabernacle. I think it was sawdust. And uh, Sister Elder, if I remember right, was on the organ. Elder Sister Elder, who's not really Elder, but it's Elder Sister Elder. The elders are always Elder. And, uh, and then I saw uh, 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 the sisters here, and then I saw uh, the boys here. Uh, they're just a neat family. They're just kind of cute. I mean, they're too tough to call cute, but they're just kind of cute. Don't you think so, Caitlin? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, and... Uh, Mitchell just looks like you want to bite him. Uh, but, uh, you know, God's got his hand on this family, and God's using them. And, uh, and I'm, just as, I'm just as proud to be associated with them as I can be. Amen. And there's, uh, there's something wrong with the musical wiring in Brother Elder. He has, he has the greatest country gospel voice but it's wired to a soul gospel sound and it just messes me up. <laughs> Hallelujah. But it's all right. It's just good no matter what. Amen. And uh, Brother Randy seems like he's one of the elders. Him and Sister Randy been around here so long. Uh, and uh, amen. Good to see the other brother Randy that is uh, a precious man of God, pastor and rifle. What a tremendous man and how proud we are, Brother Freeze and Sister Freeze. 
and they're cute girls. Here I am. And everybody here, I love everybody here. I, 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 look, let me read a text and let you be seated. Uh, I'm going to read tonight. I felt like God talked to me about this text. Before I ever got here. I'm going to read from the book of Jude. Verse 3. Beloved. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Amen. And um, I want to preach to you for a little while tonight in just a moment on the subject of don't play with the compass. Don't play with the compass. And I want the Lord to touch us tonight. I believe he will. Before you're seated, I'd like for you to pray with me that the Holy Ghost would come in here in the next few minutes and just touch us in a mighty way. Would you pray right now? God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you Heavenly Father, God, in the midst of your people, in Jesus' name, Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise God. Good to be here with all these brethren and sistern and uh, people of God. Uh, uh, the, the progress, strength, and renewal deal is, uh, that's a great name. If I was doing a conference, I think that'd be a good name for one. It kind of encompasses everything. Progress, strength, renewal. That's apostolic right there. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, and if I was doing it, I'd want Brother Mort and Brother Booker to be a part of it. <laughs> yes, sirree. Two fine young men. <laughs> Praise God. Brother Booker told us last night that the plane was leaving, and a nice woman on the plane said, you can't let this plane leave. There's an old man running to get on, and it was Brother Booker. <laughs> oh, I love that story, Elder Booker. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Brother Morton and I, we've been, we've been sheriff in Dodge for a long time. And... Uh, uh, I like people I can ride the river with and they won't leave me out in the middle when the current's strong. And uh, these are the people that, I haven't found a whole lot of people like that, to tell you the truth, but these people are like that and I like it and I like them. And I can whip both of them at one time, morning, noon, or night. But they'd get me for elder abuse. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, that goes way back. <laughs> Praise God. I got an old friend that used to be a fighter, just a fighter. He said the other night, he said, I started taking some kind of medicine they gave me, and it makes me dream. He said, I dreamed two young men was coming after me. Then he said, I knew I had to hit one of them real hard or they was going to get me. And he said, I hit him as hard as I could. And he said, I fell out of the bed and plopped over on the floor and ended up on my knees and my elbows. And he said, my wife looked down and said, did you fall out of the bed? <laughs> so that'd be just about what it'd be like. <laughs> Praise God. Good to see all of you that are here. We appreciate the invitation. It's always an honor to preach the word of God. And Brother Elder, you have put together a conference. Paul Elder has become a man of... Uh, in this area of, of wisdom and understanding. And God is using this man and this church and this woman in a special way. <clears throat> want to preach to you tonight. Um, uh, I want to preach to you tonight because I can't think of anything else that I could do that's more important than preach to you. The whole idea of church 
is foreign to this world. Institutional church and human organizations are, people are familiar with that, but the church, the Bible is clear. God's people in the Old Testament are, is clearly delineated that you will not be counted among the nations of the world. You're a different, you're a holy nation, but you're a different kind of nation. The church is literally the only thing that does not have its roots organically in the earth. It is from outside of the earth. Uh, greatest theologians in the world will tell you that the world does not know itself. And it does not have any way to know itself. The world has no, no um, compass. It has no marker to tell it about itself, to define itself. What are we and, and what is this all about? The world cannot conjure that up out of thinking. You cannot think long enough to find the answer of what is life about and what is eternity and how big is the universe and all of those big, big, big questions. There is no way in the world to find those answers. The only way those answers can be found is that the Creator graciously would drop those answers in among men. It's called revelation. And that revelation is called the Bible. And the Bible is God's revelation, His gracious gift to man from outside of the earth, which tells the world about itself and defines the world that cannot define itself. This is what preaching is. This is what teaching the Word of God does. It defines for the world what the world is, who the world is, and what the world needs. I know I'm being repetitive when I say this, but I want to emphasize at least one more time that the world has no other guidance system except the church. There is, the, the, the world has a destiny in front of it that it cannot escape. Everybody said, help me, Jesus. Because this is major. Everybody said, help me, Jesus. You and I have no, no, no guidance system. We have no a uh, way of knowing we have intuitively within us an understanding that when we die it's not over but we don't it's a river we can't cross it's a it's an understanding that's opaque we can't get through it it's there's a fog there and uh, but we are aware that there is another side and man can never get to that other side to understand where he is going uh, we know that there is an eternity we know that there is an infinite that is not subject to entropy and to uh, wearing out we we know that that is there but we how how we get there and and uh, how we face that in a way that is good for us nobody knows how to do only only the church can do this only the church can do this i i uh, don't want to be overly repetitive but i want to repeat myself again that the greatest universities in the world uh, do not deal in this. In fact, they're terrified of this. In fact, the universities of the world will spend their time trying to discount even those discussions and limit everything to what can be brought out of the human mind, what can be extrapolated out of the present to try to determine what the future is. But the Bible is clear that you cannot extrapolate out of the presence what the future is. No matter where you look in earth, you cannot find these major answers that we are talking about. They do not exist in all of the libraries of the world or all of the greatest thinkers or all of the greatest artists. Nobody can picture what it is that this is all about. Only the church can do this. Only the church has this. If you can find the church... And if the church can find you, and if you're in the church, then, then that, there is nothing greater that could happen in your life or my life than to find the church. It doesn't matter what your IQ is. It doesn't matter what possible success you could have in this world. It doesn't matter how lauded or applauded you may be by this world. There is nothing remotely close to what it means to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ does not matter whether you are considered great in the eyes of the world or whether you have very much money 
or whether you are very intelligent or whether you are educated or whether you are uh, young or old or whether you think you look good physically or don't think so or, or whether uh, you are bald or whether you have hair or whether you are black or whether you are white or any shade there between. None of that makes any particular difference. All of that is secondary in what we're talking about here tonight at Passing the Church, uh, Passing the Torch. The one thing that matters is have you come to the church that can give you the answers that nothing else can give? And if you're in that church, for God's sake, don't sacrifice it for something of this world that's just going down the tubes. Oh, let's clap our hands. Come on. We ought to really be able to clap our hands and thank God we're in the church tonight. I would drink this, but it looks like Brother Morton or Brother uh, and Brother Wilmoth and Brother Booker, and they all spit when they preach. I'll take a new one. Uh, thank you, my man. Mm. Uh. That's how Pentecostal preachers are. They just scream and holler. They're just uninhibited. And when the world's professing lecturers say you shouldn't act like that, we just laugh at them and keep on screaming and hollering and running the aisles. Because we got something. And we know what we got. How many of you know what I'm talking about tonight? Well, why don't you act like it? We got something and we know what we got and we know it's good. My God have mercy. Somebody ought to run the aisles for me until I could just get down there and run them. Oh my Lord, what a lazy congregation. I'm going to have to run the aisles for myself tonight. Oh my God have mercy. Hallelujah. Woo! Hoffer, you lazy thing. Get out here and run. Oh, glory to God. Come on, Hicks. Just because you're a school teacher don't mean you can't run. Get out here and run with me. Amen. Come on, you fat preachers. We ought to run the aisles and thank God we're saved. Oh, my Lord, God have mercy. I'm almost dead. Don't let me thank Jesus. Whew. Hallelujah. Are you glad you're saved tonight? Come on, let's praise him. Oh, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, to be saved. To be saved is the deal, man. To be saved is everything. Because there is a hell. And when they get through telling you they're in one, it'll still be there. And let me tell you, big guy, you won't be there five seconds in your sock feet till you'll convince that there's a hell. You better repent and get baptized in Jesus' name and get the Holy Ghost while you can. Woo! My Lord. So, if the church is the only way, then I want to stay in the church. But there's only about 50,000 variations of the church in the minds of people. So I want to make sure I'm in the right church. How do I know I'm in the right church? Well, first of all, in the Bible, they were all in the right church. And they were all in the same church. That's why he said, I write unto you about this common salvation. It meant that everybody had it. Now, y'all that's waiting for a profound revelation, you're fixing to get one. Everybody in the New Testament church had the common salvation. 
That's why the New Testament church was a Pentecostal church. Is this on Holy Ghost Radio? It is, huh, Doc? Okay, I love everybody out there. You're sweet. But if you're not Pentecostal, you're not in the New Testament church, brother. I love you. Everybody in the New Testament church got the Holy Ghost and spoke in other tongues. Hey, I'm not indicting you. I'm just telling you right now about the New Testament church. And no matter who you are, you got to admit that everybody in the New Testament church got the Holy Ghost and spoke in other tongues. There was no New Testament church that did not get the Holy Ghost and speak in other tongues. Not even one. There was no church anywhere that did not get the Holy Ghost and speak in other tongues. How in God's world have you come up with some kind of church that doesn't get the Holy Ghost and speak in other tongues? No, no, I mean that. How did you get some church and think it's all right when you don't get the Holy Ghost and speak in other tongues when everybody in the New Testament church did? What kind of model do you have? What, where'd you get that pattern? Don't look at me like I'm the off test. You're the one that's out of sync with the New Testament. You need to get the Holy Ghost, uh, the common salvation, and speak in other tongues. And you didn't get the Holy Ghost until you spoke in other tongues. Man, you ought to clap your hands and thank God for the Holy Ghost. You say, well, you know, the people came out of Catholicism and John Calvin and Zwingli and these other guys helped us and to move away from institutional control. They did that, I agree. And a lot of other people did stuff that had positive effects for the moment. But I gotta tell you, he said, I'm speaking to you of the common salvation. That was once delivered. I'm speaking to you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The salvation that the New Testament speaks about was only delivered once. There's only one package in the mail about salvation. It was once delivered. It wasn't delivered once on the day of Pentecost and then again at the time that the New Testament canon was completed like the Church of Christ would teach. And that's what it meant when and after that you didn't need gifts of spirit anymore. And that's what it meant when it said that which is perfect has come. That's what the Church of Christ teaches. It was once delivered. Whether it's after the New Testament is completed or whether it's tonight while I'm preaching. Whether it was in Germany or France or whether it was in Sweden. Or whether it was in England. Or whether it was in early America. This gospel that we've got was once delivered. Just once. If you're not preaching, just stay with me. If you're not preaching, what was once delivered, then to one degree or another, you're preaching some aberrant doctrine. You're preaching something that doesn't match the Bible. And after all, the Bible's the only thing we have that is a revelation 
from outside of earth's constraints that gives us direction. Only the Bible can give us that. So if I don't follow the Bible, then what am I going to follow? And how am I going to justify following something that's not the Bible? I'm talking about a common salvation that was once delivered to the saints. I'd rather stake my claims uh, on, on, on that which is once delivered to the saints. That was given to the apostle Peter and that we are preaching right now to you uh, rather than to stake my claims on something else uh, that is delivered a second or a third line down. I want to go back to the once delivered thing. I am not apostolic just because I choose it over other so-called Christian options. I'm apostolic because there are no options. Look, I'm not throwing stones. If you want to go be baptized in the name of little old Tiki Tot, you can do that. But I'm going to tell you, if you're going to follow the Bible, you're going to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin. There is no if, hands, or buts about it, and there's no way around it. No, no, I know you know this, but preaching does more than just to the people that's listening. Preaching does more, you may be seated, preaching does more than just to the people that may hear it over the internet or the people that may buy it and download it. Preaching is a proclamation that has prophetic dynamic utterance that has a supernatural element to it. Whew, I feel that supernatural element right now. It has a supernatural element to it. And when you proclaim it, you're not only proclaiming it to the people under your voice. God told Ezekiel, prophesy to the wind. There wasn't anybody there. And he was preaching, except a bunch of dry bones. And God said, prophesy to the wind. And tell the wind, come wind. And so I'm preaching tonight to the wind. Wind, I love you. Wind of the Holy Ghost, uh, you are our hope and our salvation. Wind, we can't make it without you. Come wind into this service tonight. Come wind and validate the revelation of truth from eternity and from outside of the world. Wind, we've got to have you. There is something about preaching that echoes out into the universe. It has a power beyond what I can describe. And so, what was once delivered... Where do you get this idea that there's some way to baptize other than in the name of Jesus Christ? Somebody says, well, I don't know if it's essential. Yes, it's essential. Now you know. Well, I don't, I mean, I care. But whether you do or do not believe it's essential, it is a command. And how come you haven't done it? Come on. If you tell me you love God, how come you haven't done it? Don't talk to me that it doesn't make any difference. It's a command of God. And if you haven't done it, why haven't you done it? No, no, I mean what I'm saying tonight. I'm not on the defense here. I'm on the offense here. You're on the defense if you haven't obeyed God's word. You can go ahead and laugh about that, but you won't be laughing when you get to judgment, Bob. You better obey the word of God. I'm glad to be baptized in Jesus' name. Everybody gets the will of their father that died, and Adam died in trespasses and sins, and you get the inheritance of his will, which is the wages of sin is death. But my, my father died but rose again and gives me the gift of eternal life. That's whose daddy I am. I bear his name. I'm sure not ashamed to bear his name. I'm glad to bear the name of Jesus Christ. Why aren't you bearing the name of Jesus Christ? It kind of comes down to who you're going to believe. I mean, no less than Jesus. Whom the Bible says the worlds are created by him. 
whom the Bible says has ascended far above the heavens. They've already got, they've already got telescopes out on Hubble and other places that have gone billions and trillions of miles further with sight than man has ever been. And they're out there and they think they're approaching the edge of the universe. There's a brick wall out there. Well, they didn't say that. I just threw that in. But what's on the other side of the wall? How far do the heavens go? And yet it says this Jesus that you don't want to be baptized in his name. It says this Jesus ascended far above the heavens. Where in God's world is that? But he's living inside of me and he's taken me there too because I'm baptized in his name. Are you? Just remember, you don't have any other hope. Well, I think you better quit thinking and start obeying. I'm telling you, I don't care who you are. I don't care who you think you are. You better be baptized in Jesus' name or you're going to be lost. Now I'm testifying. Now I'm going to preach in a minute. You say, well, I know my church history. Oh, do you? Oh, you do. Yes, sir. And I know that the whole evangelical world teach. Oh, well, how well do you know your church history? Who's the first guy in the history of the church that ever got the keys to the church and to the entry to the church? Do you know the most elementary 101 of church history? Who got the keys first? Multiple choice. <laughs> Luther, Calvin. Wesley, Zwingli, Wilson, or Peter. Mark X here on right answer. Peter got the keys. Who did he get them from? The guy that created the universe and went far above the heavens. You see how ridiculously important this is and Jesus said to him whatever you bind on earth is going to be bound in heaven whatever you loose on earth is going to be loose in heaven and he had the keys the guy with the keys on the day of Pentecost I know you don't know this this is all new stuff to most of you do you know the day of Pentecost is the birthday of the Christian church if you're Catholic, if you're Baptist, if you're Methodist, if you're Episcopalian or Anglican, which is basically the same thing, depending on what country you live in, or the Church of England, the same thing. If you're Seventh-day Adventist, if you're Jehovah Witness, if you're Mormon, if you're Church of God, Church of God in Christ, Church of God in God, Church of God in the Holy Ghost, Church of God, Firehouse number 26. <laughs> Whatever. You are. Your leaders will admit to you, if they know anything about Church History 101, that the church began on the day of Pentecost. And it did not begin with a lecture. It began with an experience as bad as you rational evangelicals hate experience in religion. And as terrified as you are of emotions. Come on. <laughs> on the day of Pentecost, they were all in one place in one accord. <laughs> and suddenly... There came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And their 
there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them, and they all began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Okay, now. You may be seated. I just want to know what you got to say about that. I said, what do you got to say about that? They all got the Holy Ghost. Mary, the mother of Jesus, got the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. And they all spoke in other tongues. It was a Pentecostal church receiving the Pentecostal experience with Pentecostal praise and Pentecostal gifts of the Spirit and Pentecostal preaching and Pentecostal conviction and a Pentecostal answer to conviction when they said men and brethren what shall we do he had then Peter said repent and be baptized <laughs> every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off even as many as the Lord our God shall God. All that are far off. Colorado is just about, about as far off from Jerusalem as you can get. And every second that I'm preaching sets a new record for how far off we are chronologically from the day of Pentecost. There's a new record for far off. There's a new record for far off. There's another new record for... Because each second puts us a new record of how far off it was from the day of Pentecost. But the Holy Ghost is still the same because it's not a matter of time. It's a matter of eternity invading time. And because you're a horizontal time creature, that scrambles your rational mind. But you'll never be saved until your rational mind gets scrambled and opens up and surrenders to Jesus and lets the Spirit of God come in and fill you with the Holy Ghost. Challenge week last week, we had a, a man who's been in one of my classes, and he's about 45, 48 years old. He's in the master's program. He's in an evangelical church. He's on the board of that church. He is one of the main businessmen in that church. He knew nothing about Pentecostal. But he's in this Pentecostal class talking about stuff that's totally foreign to him. And you just close the tape so this part wasn't even like it was even said there, Brother Hawkins. You know what I mean? Because I fixed it where you can't pick it up anyway, and they're going to wonder what's wrong. Okay? <laughs> and so, and so, uh, uh, every once in a while, in his, in his, in his, he'll ask questions in the class, and he'll say, I'm totally lost. I have no idea what everybody's talking about. Would somebody please help me? <laughs> I mean, it's Pentecostal terminology and stuff. He's, it's just, he's just not, he just doesn't get it. But he stayed in the class, and I encourage him to stay in the class. His name is Jalou. I said, Jalou, stay in the class. Keep going, and, we'll, and I'll send him long stuff that explains Pentecost, blah, blah, blah. And so last week we had a class on site where we're all sitting in the classroom. These others were online. And he is there. But the elder was there. And he's sitting in the class. And he's getting this first hand experience of the move of the Holy Ghost. And he's a dignified guy. And Brother Elder gets up and talks about what's going on in North Vietnam. And he is Hmong and he is from Vietnam. Very dignified man. And when Brother Elder got through, there's tears in his eyes. He said, I have no idea. He said, I can't go there. They will kill me. But he said, and he looked at Brother Elder and he said, I don't know you, but thank you for going to my country and preaching the gospel. And all of our hearts were touched. And in a little while, Someone, it was a little break, somebody came up and told me, said, when the class is over today, Jalou said, 
He wants you guys to pray for him that he can get the Holy Ghost for yeah. that. Oh, my God. And so when the class was over with, we stopped everything and said, he wants the Holy Ghost. He came up front. We laid hands on him. We begin to worship God. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. It's no secret to us. Woo! It's, here to, it's here in passing the torch. <laughs> and in just a few minutes, he's speaking in other tongues as the Spirit give the utterance. I'm telling you, it's for everybody. Did you know, some of you do, but many of you don't, that Pentecostals are growing over seven times as fast as Islam and over seven times as fast as evangelical Christianity and over seven times as fast as Catholicism and o over eight or nine times as fast as Buddhism you say, well, they don't all, they're not all baptized in Jesus' name. Where you at, Brother Wayberry? Come up here, Bishop. Come up here, my Bishop. My Bishop. My Bishop, come up here. My Bishop. I went to Uganda and rode with Brother Wayaberry and his wonderful wife. And we could not get his 19 children in the car. <laughs> Besides hundreds of more children that he has in orphanages. Whose fathers had their eyes poked out and their hands cut off and their heads cut off. And in some cases the kids watch them play soccer with their father's head. Macabre, bizarre, grisly. He was kind of careful with us while we was there that we didn't get attacked. No, we will not stay in that hotel. We will go stay in this hotel. No, I wouldn't do that. Go with me. And then I looked down and wondered what was moving under my feet, and we had a chicken in the car. It was fast food. <laughs> All right, pluck him. <laughs> Brother Wayaberry used to organize crusades for some of the biggest charismatic names that you know in Uganda. Names from America. He came to America and visited one of our churches where a humble preacher who was not the pastor, who was the outreach director, took Brother Wayberry into his home and began to teach him a home Bible study. Brother Wayberry, at that time, was bishop of these 400,000 people. He began to teach him about Acts 2.38. Finally, it dawned on Brother Webberry that this man was saying, you don't have everything you need. And Brother Webberry is a very intelligent man, and he got a little bit angry. <laughs> and he got up one morning and he said, hey, you are telling me that I'm not saved. I am a bishop. I am a... And this old boy just... He was sweet and nice. And he said, Bishop Weber, I'm just telling you what's in the Bible. Do you want to obey it or do you not want to obey it? L let me just tell you, you didn't write the Bible, sir. And I didn't write the Bible. 
And it's pretty hubristic to think that you're going to stand up and give your opinion on what we ought to do when you were never given the keys in the first place. How are you going to get the car even started when you don't even have the key? Peter's the guy with the key. You better get in the car that's going to heaven. So Brother Wayberry was angry for a day or two. And then God visited him in the night. And the next morning he got up weeping and said, I see it. Okay. Now he was with a group of about 400,000. He went home. He taught his preachers. And they baptized their people. Now I saw... Brother Baker, I mean, he called me the other day and said, now it's more like 600,000. He thinks, does anybody know? Is there any way to know? How would you know how many? But I've been there, and I taught over 1,100 preachers under a brush arbor where the restroom was just a little block wall with a little curtain behind it, and the block wall only came to here. So you just waved at people. <laughs> hey, I mean, you know. What can I say? Everybody else was doing it. I mean, I mean, you're going to go, so. But now, it's not only Uganda. <laughs> it's... Cameroons, it's Tanzania, it's Kenya, it's Rwanda, Rwanda. Congo, Congo. Tanzania. Tanzania, Sudan. Sudan. <laughs> My God. We ought to take an offering for him right now. Where's the buckets? I'm going to give the first hundred dollars. Let's take an offering. I'm not through preaching. We may be here all night. Where are you going to go? Smoke cigarettes or to some ball game or to get drunk? Where are you going to go? Come on. We're in the place we ought to be. Ushers, are you coming tonight or tomorrow morning? Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Okay. Look at this. Brother Solace. Good man. Let, okay. If you're going to... Look. We're going to just take an... Am I going too fast for y'all? You know, it might be good, folks, if we just gave this good man a little love offering here tonight. Would you reach in your... Come on, let's give him... I, I, I got stuff to preach. I don't have time to take all night. Come on, everybody give a $100 bill. Come on. Amen. Yes, sir, re Bob Taylor. We're going to do this. Hey. And then some of our preacher boys, some of our preacher boys as young as 26 years old. Are you listening while you're giving? Some of our preacher boys as young as 26 years old have went over there and hundreds are receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Ah. And you know who many of them are? Many of them are these orphan kids and they don't have any other future. And so Brother Warebear is raising them. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to be hundreds and hundreds of apostolic orphan preachers uh, that are going to be preaching the gospel throughout Africa. Doesn't that excite you? Let's stand up and clap our hands and praise the Lord. Come on, give. Oh, glory to God. I see some of you guys talking to me about $10,000, right? Maybe. Maybe. So, if he is, write the check. All right, you may be seated. That's good. Yeah, I was just in passing. We're not making a big deal out. Thank you, bro. Now, remember, the Bible's all we got. What I'm preaching to you is what they preached in the Bible. When people start giving you all this hogabalaga about, oh, well, I, this has happened since then. I, I don't care what's happened since then. There's only once delivered to the church, to the saints. That once delivered is what was preached in the book of Acts. That's it. Don't give me nothing else. Everything beyond that is something man-made. Because there's a lot of apostolics getting off track, I just thought maybe I'd just hammer that home tonight. In my introduction, this, this first five minutes. Oh. 
Oh, man, I'm so glad I'm baptized in Jesus' name and got the Holy Ghost. If they come and said, renounce or we're going to cut your head off, I'd say, get a sharp sword, do it quick. I am not renouncing. I'm so happy to be a part of Jesus. So, so I'm not uh, too enamored with the modern day apostolic chop shops. They want to chop apostolic stuff out of the apostolic message. Let's lower the roof. Let's cut part of the fenders off. Let's, let's take the emblem off. Moles for Christ underground. You can't get the light of the world in you and stay incognito. But doctrine, lifestyle, anointed life. There's people that are playing. Oh, yeah, the name of this message is don't play with the compass. Yeah, okay, here's, here's where I got that. I preached Brother Marvin Treese's funeral and Ricky Treese uh, sat down with me before the funeral and he said, Brother Wilson, I'm just going to talk to you for an hour or two and then you do with it what you want. In the process of that talk, he told me that when he was a little boy, his father would take him hunting in the deep woods in Louisiana, coon hunting. And they had dogs. But he said, my, he said, my father would hunt deep in the woods. And he said, in Louisiana, in the middle of the night, where there's trees everywhere and sometimes no moon, he said, it can be so dark you can't even see your hand in front of your face. And there's uh, bios everywhere. And he said, you can get out there and get lost and be lost for several days. Or you can fall off in a bio. An alligator, eat your britches. Anything can happen. And he said, my daddy used to carry me. He said, when I was about four years old, we'd go out and he would carry me. And in front of him, my legs lock around him. And, and he said, I would, I would be facing him as he carried me a little strap. And he said, he would wear bib overalls, like Brother Morton was preaching about, and had pockets up here, like, you know, Bib overalls and coveralls, I guess, have them too. But bib overalls have these little pockets. And, uh, I mean, I never wore them. I was born in civilization. But, <laughs> but I understand it. I understand it. And, uh, and he said, he said, my dad had a compass. And he said, my dad was one of the best guys in the woods. People knew it. For not getting lost and he said so he said one night we were out there and he said he was hunting and I was bored bouncing along there and uh, and he said so I was looking at his chest and I saw this chain and I pulled this compass out and he said it was so intriguing he said I was looking at it and started playing with it and he said, when my dad realized what I was doing, he said, son, give me that compass. You can play with some things, but you can't play with our compass. Because our compass is the only thing. He said, now you've got to know how to use it. But he said, if we get in deep woods and we can't find our way out, he said, this compass is the only thing that will get us out of here. So we can't afford to be playing with our compass because our compass is what's going to give us direction. And I'd propose to you today that there are people in the apostolic movement that are playing with the compass. That have decided that it's all right to live in the lowlands. You know this tsunami that hit Japan here a year or two ago? And you probably saw pictures in the paper, wherever that, I mean, it came in like, what? I, I don't know, 100 feet deep, maybe more, and swept away the whole city and 
thousands and thousands of people died. Did you know, if you would walk up on that hill, the city was down here and the, be the water come in here and then it goes up into the hills kind of in a bowl like and on down the coast. If you'd walk up in those hills to a certain level, there are old, really old, they're 600 years old. There are, there are old monuments that are 600 years old up there. And those old monuments say, don't build below here. Don't build below here. But some smart college graduate engineer somewhere came along and said, ah, man, I'm looking here. It's been centuries and nothing's ever happened here. This is pretty long haul we're in when you talk about eternity. And they built that whole city over a period of years. And then somebody got a little worried. They said, you know, this is low and, uh, and there is a history that a tsunami or some come through here years ago. And we better do something. So they built a 25 foot man-made concrete wall, 25 foot high, that's high that would stop a wave from hitting that city. All the man-made structures that attempt to save this world are gonna be like that 25-foot wall. When that tsunami went to that wall, it just got higher and higher, and then it swept over that wall, and it went many feet over that wall, and it swept across that freeway, and it drug those cars into those buildings, and it inundated and covered up that wall, and covered up those buildings, and covered up those people. But there was a monument that said 600 years before. But it was old. They don't know what they're talking about. Peter was a long time ago. We've got a lot of erudite scholars that know more now than what they knew in the Bible. And the next time you get to thinking, you know a whole lot. Remember, those men that wrote that Bible sat for three years at the feet of the man that created the heavens and the earth. For three years, day and night. Don't you dare think you know more than they knew. Don't you dare say they were just unlearned fishermen. That's foolish. And if you follow that, you will become a fool. So, now I've been talking about doctrine. I could talk about lifestyle. You know, well, it's just a matter of, you know, it's just a matter of people's opinions. Oh, is that right? Well, what about all those scriptures in the Bible that are not just a matter of our opinion, but it says explicitly and clearly about separation from the world. It says explicitly and clearly about how you dress and how you look and, and, and about being painted and about... Uh, and about hair and about, I mean, uh, look, hey, oh, hold on, hold on. You don't have to believe it if you don't want to. You can believe somebody that says, oh, that's just cultural. I'll hit that in just a minute. Oh, that's just culture. You can believe what you want to. But while you're doing that, you remember it's in that book. And that book's not very big to be sent from eternity. I don't think there's anything wasted in that book. I'd rather trust this book than whoever your scholar is any day of the week. Now, I don't have time to go into all this, but somebody says, well, yeah, I, I, you know, one, one that, is, that is in modern turmoil in Pentecostal ranks is hair. I mean, that's a good one. It's as good as any of them. Hair. Of all things, hair on a man's head. Whew. It cost Absalom his life. Or hair on a woman's head. The first half of 1 Corinthians 11 talks about that. Y'all know that. Y'all know what it says. 
Y'all that don't know this, listen to this somewhere out there in the ether of the air. You'll get your Bible and read it. Hey, look, right now I'm not defending or offending, I hope. I'm just telling you that that's in the Bible. Hello. I mean, if you don't believe it's in the Bible, pick up your Bible and read it. It's in the Bible. Well, my preacher doesn't talk about that. Well, your preacher's just ignoring part of the Bible. I mean, if you want to go to a place where your preacher's ignoring part of the Bible, that's your prerogative. Thank God for America, but I'd advise you to go back to the Bible. It's in the Bible. Everybody said it's in the Bible. And it talks about a woman's long hair. It, 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 there's three levels of hair there. There's shorn, shaven, and long. So you, de you decide what long means. Shorn means cut, shaven means bald, and long. Pretty well defines itself. Okay, but now here's, here's what is said. That's the first half of Corinthians 11. The second half is about communion, but, we, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the first half tonight. Uh, so, here's how people get around that. Most of the time, and I've read how many of these, how many of these have I read? That Corinth was a wicked city and that there was uh, prostitutes. Pray tell where there were not prostitutes. But anyway... And that this was a cultural thing that Paul, you don't find him teaching this to any other church. You just find him teaching it. How long have I been preaching? Not long enough. Amen. Ah, uh, y'all are being kind. You say not long enough. You'll go home and you guys say, my God, I thought the guy was never going to quit. <laughs> oh, good. It's only 1230. Are you having a good time? I want to tell you, if you were out there listening to some dry lecture, it, it wouldn't be near this good. Or some comedian trying to make up stuff that's funny. The stuff we use is really funny. And you can't find a subject that's deeper than the one I'm on. I mean, like going to heaven, eternity, like, duh, I mean, you can't get any deeper than that. So, but, it, but he didn't say nothing about hair to any of the other churches. And so this is a cultural thing. It was just to the church in Corinth. Well, but then you've got to answer 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. Ding. <clears throat> then you've got to answer 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. Ah. Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. He lets you know he's writing to everybody. If I stop right there, that's enough to blow your cultural theory out the door. But I'm not going to stop right there. I'm going to 1230. Well, maybe not quite. Look at 2 and 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden, hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Paul said, what I'm telling you is the wisdom of God in a mystery. In other words, he's saying, don't be shocked that the world doesn't understand this. This is the hidden of God. and This is the wisdom of God. It's hidden. It's a hidden wisdom. And it was ordained before the world unto our glory. You're into big stuff here now. You're not into this little flexible fashion and I'm not either. But our neighbors can make us think we're out of step. But we're not out of step. They're out of step. Look at verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. 
So tonight, when, when, I'm, when I'm preaching this, and I'm, I'm gentle and kind, warm and fuzzy, I love you. But that doesn't change the fact that the first half of the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians is in the Bible, and it talks about men's hair and women's hair being cut and uncut respectively. I mean, I, I, whatever you do, I love you. I'm just telling you, you've got to, you're confronted here. And so, if you've got a pastor that condones that, then I would have to say to you, your compromising pastor is trying to tell you it's a cultural thing, and he is dead wrong. And I'm mad at him for messing you up. I love him, but I'm mad at him. Bless God, if he was messing me up, I'd pack my bags and get out of there tomorrow morning. You go home and tell him I said it and give him my phone number. I mean, you're talking about heaven or hell. We're not talking about whether you got somebody sitting on your padded pew. We're talking about obeying the holy word of God that came down from heaven. That's heavy. That's heavy. That's heavy. And where does it put me if I failed as a mailman to deliver the mail? Where does, that, where does that put my salvation? I mean, if I wasn't called to preach, maybe I could get away without, without talking about this. But I'm called to preach. So I'm, I'm, I'm a servant. I'm under another man's orders. I didn't write it. I'm only delivering it. 1 Corinthians 4.17 for this cause have I sent unto you, Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faith in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, did your compromising pastor read these scriptures to you when he told you that that was all cultural and it was only for Corinth? Did your compromising pastor read these scriptures? Does he even know they're in there? Yes, sir. Come on, this is part of it. Yeah. Boy, it's so quiet here, you can hear a mouse licking ice. Hey, I'm 66 years old. I may fall over dead any moment. I'm going to preach it, and I'm going to love you while I'm doing it, but I ain't backing up for you or nobody else. Because I don't have any choice. Don't you get it? And neither does that compromise in pastor years. That's right. That's right. First Corinthians seven seventeen or seven something. Just throw one up there. We'll make it work. <laughs> but as God hath distributed every man as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all churches. Paul was consistent. And if you've ever been to Turkey and saw where all these churches were, they're just a few miles apart. You know good and well he wasn't over here teaching one thing and 10 miles away teaching another thing. I mean, I'm just using this for an example. I mean, there's other examples. 11, 1 and 2. I mean, he starts this chapter with, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Verse 2. Why, wow, you're good on that screen, whoever you are. I can't even find you, but I like the way you do it. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Duh. Look at 11.14. 11.14. I probably wrote it down wrong. 1 Corinthians 11.14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her for her, given her for a covering. You know that. Verse 16. But if any man seem to be contentious... Now you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna. There's people that's hear me tonight out there in La La Land. They're saying, "I don't read that." He's a. <laughs> 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 yeah. I mean, they're going crazy. <laughs> Have at it. Wherever you gnaw, it'll be on a scar. I'll just tell you that much. Go ahead and gnaw. It'll be on a scar. If any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom. Neither the churches of God. You see how it is? 
But now, if I was up here trying to wow you away from what the compass has set. Ah, you said it, Jimmy, just right. True north. What the compass has set. Then I'd be saying, ah, now this matters, you know. And I would just close this part of this little dissertation by saying, if you can, if you can just take out the first half of 1 Corinthians, I don't want to. I want to leave it. I believe I'll take out the second half. I don't, like, I don't believe in communion anymore. I don't think it, it was just cultural. It was just for Corinth. You take out the first half of chapter 11, I'll take out the second half. No more communion. Bless God, we don't need it. Just a cultural thing anyway. You see what happens when you start just deciding what you're going to take out of the Bible? Yeah, well, and some's already taken out Acts 2.38. Well, I don't believe it. Well, it don't matter whether you believe it or not. It's still in there. And I believe it, and I'm grateful to God that I believe it. And I want to embrace it. And I'm getting ready to close. But I want to tell you. This is my belief, and I believe I can back it up, but I don't have time tonight. Every dynamic component of the church that was neared instantaneously on the day of Pentecost. I'm not into gradualism, incrementalism. Well, they got that there, but in the third century, they learned how to, they knew more about the Godhead than Peter did. And that's when they figured out how to use numbers to tell what God's like. God is the number three. God is third and fourth century. And if you talk to these people, they will actually tell you, well, well, the New Testament church, it wasn't fully formed. Not fully formed? Who do you think they were? Just a bunch of... You get it. Of course it was fully formed. The saving message was preached on the day of Pentecost. The gifts of the Spirit appeared on the day of Pentecost. The preaching that's necessary appeared on the day of Pentecost. Baptism appeared on the day of Pentecost. The gifts of the Spirit appeared on the day of Pentecost. Pentecostal worship appeared on the day of Pentecost. It all appeared there. And that dynamic component of the church, which is where its life is. Now, I would just say, this is why people who, it's ringing a little bit up here. Uh, uh, this is why people, it was ringing. What was I preaching about? Okay, I'll just preach about something else. And if you have a television, you need to get rid of it. Hey, listen, you ain't going to mess me up. I got plenty to preach about. Love it. And you go into them old ball games. A lot of apostolic churches that were apostolic churches have decided they want to go to ball games primarily because their preachers are backslid enough they want to go to ball games. This is my Dale Carnegie course tonight <laughs> on how to win friends and influence people. Did you know that some of the, some of the most concentrated sex trafficking in America, and there's a lot of it, goes on at the Super Bowl? Sex trafficking in underage kids and goes on at the World Series and goes on at the NBA Finals. Oh, it's just a game, Brother Wilson. We go there, and our church goes there. Oh, you do, huh? Did you know that there's probably more gambling goes on, billions of dollars of gambling goes on over those games? It's greed, love of money. Did you know that everything there is about glorifying the flesh, catching, running, throwing, shooting? It's all about the flesh, naked women. It's all about the flesh. Do you know I had the statistics here a few years ago that the NBA had 357 players in it and there were 357 exactly illegitimate children in the, of players in the NBA. My God, have mercy. 
I take it all back. He's going to preach it tomorrow. <laughs> hey, now not every one of them had an illegitimate child, but one of them had 10. And you got your kids with their posters in, your, in their bedrooms. And you're, my God, you are dumber than a box. And you got preachers justifying that stuff and bringing it in their churches on Super Bowl Sunday afternoon. I want to tell you, they are so far from understanding what's going on in this world. It's pathetic. Oh, I love them, but that don't cut no ice. We're talking about eternity. And you're playing with the souls of people. In Hollywood. Movies in your home or in the theater or on the television. Hollywood movies. You're going to, did you know 96% or better of people in Hollywood don't go to church at all? The, and most of them have a hedonistic philo uh, philosophy. And they were so immoral that in the early days, the city of L.A. would not even recognize Hollywood. That's why they had to go out in Hollywood, because they were so sleazy. And you sit there and justify and say that that's all okay and well. <laughs> Come on, bub, pray through. Well, I don't know what my church would do if we took a stand on it. Well, let's find out. Invite me over. I'll help you. Come on. Come on now. You're talking about the souls of people. And you're letting prostitutes. You're letting whoremongers. You're letting people that nothing matters to them except flesh come into your living room and flaunt themselves uh, and posture as though they are a hero and you're going to tell me that's all right. Come on. You're not that dumb. You know better than that. You say, well, Brother Wilson, you preach like that. You won't have anybody left. <laughs> I guess we'll all find out, won't we? All the churches that I know that's really growing are the ones preaching like this. Well, Brother Wilson, we don't want to confront people. We just want to love them in. I don't quite get that. The gospel's confront. There is no more confrontational word in the world than repent. I mean, that's about the ultimate confrontation. Repent! That means a total about face. You're going this way, you got to go this way. They didn't only say repent, they said, repent or perish! The reason you don't think it'll work is because unless you're working in spiritual revelation, you don't really understand the chemistry of the human makeup. You just think you understand it. And you think man doesn't want to make an about face. But deep in his soul, beneath all of those more shallow desires that you're catering to, is a desire for deliverance from the power of sin and a desire to be extricated from stuff that's all going to burn like wood, hay, and stubble. And a desire to find a place where the purity and power of eternity streams into the finite world and gives people hope. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Well, we ought to stand up. We ought to sing Andale Pronto. And we ought to celebrate what we've got. And if you don't have it tonight, we invite you to be a part of God's army. At least try it. And I'm not preaching this as though we're something you're not. It's like one beggar telling another beggar, I found bread. Come on, share it with me, man. I got bread. I'll get here. I'll show you. You eat it and see if you don't like it. Are you glad you're saved tonight? If you don't have the Holy Ghost, come on down here. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, come on down here. God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. 
Oh, my Lord. Hallelujah. If you got the Holy Ghost, come on down here. If you do have it, if you don't have it, if you want it or don't want it, come on down here. Hey. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all, come on down here. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Hey, I just, you know, these phones are a pain, aren't they? I just got a text. You don't have to worry about influencing people or winning friends. You have us behind you. <laughs> Call it out. We're talking about the souls of people. Thank you for sounding a certain sound. Thank you for not playing with the compass. You preach it like that and you'll have a following. That's starving for this kind of direction and separation. Man, that's what you call blowing up the phone on positives. Woo! Hallelujah! My Lord! Yeah! There's probably a lot of other people, if they had my number, they would be... Here's one. Wow, did you ever more preach tonight? We all listen to you. Hot tamale. Oh, that's my wife. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. Okay, let's make peace with everybody on the internet. Okay, everybody on the internet that doesn't believe what I preach or doesn't want to believe it, don't. I love you. Don't. If you want to, you can just go to hell. I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to do that. But that's the great thing about living in America. Nobody's going to force you. And I don't believe people ought to force you. Ah, uh -uh, if you don't want to believe the Bible, you ought to have a right not to believe the Bible. Ah, that's America. That's America. If you don't want to believe it, you don't have to believe it. I mean, you may wreck America that way, but uh, it's still America. That's your, that's your progress. I love you. Let's have coffee sometime. Fat chance. But it won't change. I just want to get this across to you. You and I are not going to change what's in the Bible. And don't let somebody talk you into saying what's in the Bible is not in the Bible. Or it doesn't mean what it says. Because the Word of God is going to stand. Okay. In the spirit of revelation, what song do we have, guys? What? Sounds to me like you got more Holy Ghost than your nephews. Why don't you lead it out? No, I'm just kidding. Come on. Let's sing. Come on. Baptize me, Jesus, with the Holy Ghost. Sing it like you mean it tonight. Sing this song with me Trying to turn me around But I'm determined To stand my ground But I can't do it There's just no way Until you baptize me Let's sing it in the Holy Ghost. Oh, Ghost. With the Holy Ghost. Anybody don't have the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost tonight. Your word. Anybody need a renewal of the Holy Ghost tonight? Trying to turn me around. But I'm determined. To stand my ground Oh, but I can't do it There's just no way I can't do it Until you baptize me Come on, if you don't know it Look at the words and let's sing it together Baptize me, Jesus With the 
lift your hands. Come on, let's praise him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's praise him. Let's praise him. Hallelujah. There is no message that's greater than this gospel message. There is no message that's greater than this Acts 238 message. There is no message outside of this one God message. The only message is separation and holiness. There is no other message. Come on, let's praise Him again, everybody. Everybody, I feel the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Sorry, this is the way we do it, Pueblo. Listen, we're going to do it here in a minute. Some of you acting like it's too loud and all that. You're a bunch of hypocrites. I remember before God filled you with the Holy Ghost, you were standing down in the mosh pit right in front of the speakers. Uh, and when the Doobie Brothers started up, you were jamming and bopping uh, and whoever it was. And now you want to stand there and act like you're all cool and sophisticated. Sorry, I've been baptized in Jesus' name. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. It's time to have a little church around here.
My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. My God, I feel the anointing. Hallelujah. Yeah. Excuse me, I gotta do it a few more minutes. The Holy Ghost is breaking out in its order. Come on. Come on. God's doing the work. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, 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 Yeah, 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 that's it, brother. Come on, that's victory. That's deliverance. Yeah. I gotta praise, I gotta praise, and I gotta get it out. I gotta praise. I, I gotta praise, I gotta praise, and I gotta get it out. I gotta praise. I, I gotta praise, I gotta praise, and I gotta get it out. I gotta praise. I, I gotta praise. I gotta praise and I gotta get it out. I gotta praise. Leave the joy, 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 leave the joy. Leave for God, 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 leave for God. If you're not ashamed to praise the Lord, let me see you clap your hands. If you're not ashamed to praise the Lord, let me see you stomp your feet. If you're not ashamed to praise the Lord, let me see you leave for joy. Leave for joy, 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 leave for joy. Yeah, 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 that's victory. That's victory. That's victory. I, I gotta praise. I gotta praise and I gotta get it out. I gotta praise. I, I gotta praise. I gotta praise and I gotta get it out. I gotta praise. I, I gotta praise. I gotta praise and I gotta get it out. I gotta praise. I, I gotta praise. I gotta praise and I gotta get it out. I gotta praise. Hey, leave for joy. 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 Leave
right now in this order. Miracles. Give him the praise he's worthy of. God, we praise you. Hallelujah.